If I could figure out why people don't come to church, I hate to harp on this after Jim just did, but I'd love to know why. I just don't understand. But that's the way it goes. So we're glad you're here. That's all that matters, right? I'm preaching to the choir. Oh, well, that's all right. Well, <laughs> that's good. All right. Could you turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians, please? We're going to be in chapter 10 and 11. We're going to have communion today. Um, and we'll get to that in just a minute. But I was thinking about communion. And a lot of times, it's just something they throw at the end of the service. Isn't that right? Sometimes we just, oh, it's Communion Sunday, the first Sunday of the month. And sometimes we get into a routine and we get into a habit and we don't really realize and understand what we're doing when we're taking communion. So this morning I'm going to give you all the features of what happens when you take communion. And if, if I do that, maybe it'll make things a little different or you'll think about things a little bit more when it's time for communion. Communion is very necessary. In fact, the Lord commanded us to take communion and to be baptized. They're the two ordinances of the church. And as believers, you need to take communion. You really do. Now, we're going to look at six or seven different things that when you take communion, what you're actually doing. Okay, and I don't know if I told you the story or not, but when I was little, my favorite TV show was Gunsmoke. Anybody remember Gunsmoke? All right, I'd watch Gunsmoke. Did I tell you this story already? Oh, I get sidetracked. But I'd, I'd watch Gunsmoke, and then we'd be sitting at the bar with Miss Kitty, okay? And uh, they'd all be sitting there with a shot glass, and they'd go like this. One Sunday, during communion, I thought, hey, that sounds pretty neat. So when I got the little cup, down the hatch, just like Marshall Dillon did. What do you think I got when I got home? I did. I did. See, I didn't realize how important this was or what it was. To me, it was just like gun smoke, you know? So I want, not that you would ever do something like that, but uh, I just want to make sure that we understand when we're taking communion, what actually are we doing? And I never could figure out when you're supposed to pray, when you're supposed to keep your, uh, you know, uh, eyes closed or your head bowed or, I, I never understood all that. So I'm going to help you with that today. And when you pray during the communion, what do you pray for? Anybody ever think about that? What do you pray for? So I'm going to help you. Because it bothered me, and I didn't understand it 100%, but we will when we get done. There's certain features that need to be understood when we take communion. There's certain things that we need to be thinking about. And when we take communion, we shouldn't be thinking about anything else. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. The first thing that we do when we take communion is... We remember Christ's saving work on the cross. Look at chapter 11, 1 Corinthians, verse 25. 11, 25. Remember Christ's saving work on the cross. Now, this is obvious because we're going to partake of the cup and the bread, and we know that. But I want you to think this morning, when we're taking communion, we are to remember Christ's saving work on the cross. Look at 11, 25. After the same manner, also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Remember the broken body. Remember the blood that was shed. Remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for you on the cross. Um, first of all, he delivered you from sin. Wait a second, I need something. He delivered you from sin, first of all, 
on the cross. He also guaranteed you a place in heaven that you can live forever and ever and ever. Now, his death on the cross was for our life. Is that right? His death for our life. And the bread and the cup symbolizes that. What should our response be when we're taking communion and we take the bread and the cup? The response when we're, should be what? Awe. Okay, what else? Thanks. Praise. Okay. These are the things that should be running through your mind and you thinking about during communion. His death on the cross and the sacrifice. Second thing is when we take communion, did you realize that Jesus is right here with us? Now, I'm not talking about the bread and the cup because in some circles of religion they call it transubstantiation where they actually believe that the blood and the bread actually become the body of Christ no these are symbols symbols of the body and and the blood of Christ and he is here he is here with us right now we have communion with him look at chapter 10 verse 16 Chapter 10, verse 16. The cup of the blessing which we bless, is it not communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? He is here. We can have personal communion with him. Did you ever think about that? He is here. And we can also realize he's here with us. And we can have personal communion with him because of what he did on the cross. We have access to Jesus anytime. But I believe with all my heart that when we take communion, it's very special to Jesus. He has commanded us to do it. He said, do this in remembrance of me. That's what we need to do. We need to realize we're communing with him. Third thing, 1, John chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17 we are having communion with each other. All 17 of us right now are able to commune with each other this morning. 1017, for we being many are one bread, one body, and we are all partakers of the one bread. This, this is our church family. If you don't show up at family gatherings, you get a bad name. Trust me, I know, all right? We have communion with our families on Christmas, Thanksgiving. Um, we have fellowship with them on birthdays and anniversaries. And Now, I'm, I'm telling you, it's important for us to have fellowship one with another during the communion service. Amen. We can commune with Jesus and we can commune with each of us. You gotta realize that we're all equal. Amen. We're all equal at the foot of the cross. We have something in common. What is the thing that we have in common? Jesus. Jesus. And forgiveness for our sin. And this is something that we should be able to communion with, commune with and to communicate with each other because we're all brothers and sisters. It's, it's a family. So let's realize that when we take communion, um, there's kind of a oneness of the body of Christ and the body of Christ is you guys, all right? Fourthly, chapter one, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 20. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. I would not that ye should have fellowship with demons. The fourth thing I'm going to talk about, of course, the fifth thing. The fifth thing is when we have communion, we fellowship, we worship singly one person. Who is it? Your mind. Oh, my, I'm sorry. I didn't even realize it. Thank you. Oh, well, it's just me. I wasn't even thinking. Oh, it's me. We should have 
a singleness of mind. We don't need to be thinking about what you're having for lunch. We don't need to be thinking about what you're going to do after you take your nap this afternoon. You don't need to worry about what you're going to do tomorrow and all week. When we take communion, we need to worship one person, Amen. and we need to singly, each one of us, individual. Look, he's worthy of our worship. Amen. He's not going to want to be divided. He's not going to want us to go and, uh, well, Paul says your worship with demons. I know we're not going to do that. But when you take your eyes off of Jesus during communion, and when you were thinking about a million other things, and look, I'm busy too. There's a lot of things that we can be thinking about. But for 10 minutes, five minutes, can you just focus in on Jesus? That's what we should be doing when we take communion. Christ alone, Christ alone should be our focus at communion. Now, I want to look at one other one, chapter 11, verse 28. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. The other thing we need to realize when we take communion, we need to examine our hearts. We need to think during the communion service and before the communion service, and we're going to have that opportunity. We need to realize there may be something in my life that's not right. Now, there may be something in my life that would be displeasing to the Lord. If you eat and drink of the communion, without examining yourself, without having uh, something to think about during the communion, other than your unforgiven sin, unconfessed sin, it needs to be taken care of ahead of time. Because if not, what's it say? It says that many are sickly and many sleep. Now, I wondered why Jesus wants us to take communion regularly. The reason is, if we, don't, if we don't think about all these things on an everyday basis, we don't do it, do we? But maybe once a month or once whenever we take communion, if you think about these things, the death and his work on the cross, the communion we can have with Jesus. The communion can we can have with our own fellow believers. And the way that we can examine ourselves. Look, if somebody doesn't tell you to examine yourself or check out what's inside you that's not right, how often will you do it? Probably never. Oh, it may bother us a little bit, but you know, it needs to be regular, and that's why. He wants us to remember all these elements all the time. And we are so busy and so preoccupied that unless we're reminded of this, why does he use this, do this in remembrance of me? Why does he say remember it? Because we always forget or we neglect. So he wants us to regularly take communion. All right? It's important. Look at chapter 11, verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he comes. You are, by taking communion, proclaiming your anticipation of his coming back. Okay? Now, when you get baptized, when you get baptized, you, you're proclaiming to everyone around what? Tell me. What are you proclaiming? What are you showing all the people that are witnessing your baptism? That's exactly right. You are proclaiming that you're a believer and that you have your sins forgiven. This is the same proclamation we're doing here. That's why communion 
and the Lord's and uh, baptism are connected. They're both a proclamation. Now, you're going to proclaim the cross, and if an unbeliever would walk in during communion, that would be a wonderful thing, wouldn't it? Because they're seeing all the people in here proclaiming their forgiveness of sin. And also, he says, remember this till I come. Till I come. Are we going to have communion in heaven? Hey, did you ever think about that? It's the real thing, though, isn't it? It's not just symbols. It's not just grape juice and crackers. And I often wonder why they didn't give you more. I mean, you get hungry, you, you, want, grape, you want crackers and grape juice. Why don't they give you enough? It's because it's not a meal. It's not a meal. When you get to heaven, you're going to have communion with Jesus. You're going to be able to commune with him. And you're going to commune with millions and millions of, of, of believers that have the same thing in common with you. Communion must take a year to do in heaven, but time doesn't matter, right? It's going to be wonderful. It's going to be wonderful. And you are proclaiming the fact that you know Jesus to everybody that walks in and everybody that's out there. You know, I was saved when I was seven years old. And when I got saved, all my friends about that age, everybody gets saved. You know, you go to a bat. I went to Davisville Baptist Church. So basically, all my friends were getting baptized. So they'd come to me and say, Charlie, you getting baptized? I said, no. I didn't like water. I failed swimming lessons at Fisher's Pool up there. My mother took me for swimming lessons, and I flunked. I, didn't, I just didn't care for it, okay? And then... I couldn't figure out why should I get wet? Why? I didn't understand it. I didn't appropriate it to my own life. So I didn't get baptized. I didn't get baptized. But when I was 22, the Lord placed it upon my heart to get baptized. And when I got baptized, I realized it wasn't just a matter of getting wet. I realized the preacher wasn't going to drop me. I realized that it was important, so then I got baptized. And you know, in the ministry since 1982 I've been, do you realize how many people I had to baptize that had already been baptized? Why did they come to me to be baptized after they had been believers' baptism? Because when they got believers' baptism, there was peer pressure to do it. They didn't understand it, and they didn't really mean it. I had a lot of people say, why don't you uh, baptize me again? Because I really didn't get it. I'll never forget my first baptism that I did. First of all, I've never spent a day in Bible college or seminary. I don't know if they teach you that in Bible college or not, but they should. So I went to a friend of mine and I said, could you teach me how to baptize? I got a baptism coming up. So he showed me what to do. Well, the first baptism we had, we had in a YMCA because we didn't have a baptism pool. Uh, the only baptism I pool I had at that time was, it was a one room building and the floor slanted this way. And when it rained, everything came up front. We had to mop the floor after every time we had a, a flooding rain. So I could have baptized in the front. But what I did was, I got taught how to baptize somebody, not to drop them what to do, what to say. We got to the pool at the YMCA. The first person that I baptized was in a full body brace. Full body brace, head to toe. So I thought to myself, how's this gonna work? You know, it's like, he's in a full body brace. How am I gonna baptize him? Well, I talked to him about it. And he said, Charlie, I really want to get baptized. I said, okay, we'll do it. I got somebody to come in the pool with me, and we had a chair, okay? He went into the locker room to, to get out of his body brace, and he crawled from the locker room to the pool. 
Now, did he want to get baptized? And everybody there was in tears. Me too. Because he knew what it was about. He knew and he understood how important it was. And he didn't care. Can I tell you about the second one that moved that night, that day? She was a young girl, about 20. And when she was a little girl, she was playing on the floor in the kitchen. And her mother dropped a frying pan full of hot oil on her head. She had no hair. Her face was all scarred up. She wore a wig, and a lot of people didn't know this story. She said, Charlie, I want to get baptized. <laughs> After the first one, I didn't know what to say. I said, you know, you're going to have to take off your wig. I don't care. She came out and went in the pool, bald as an eagle. Her face was scarred completely. And she told everybody by doing that she was a Christian. She proclaimed the fact, no matter what she looked like or whether the other guy could walk or not, they proclaimed to everyone present that Jesus was their Savior. Now, when you take communion, you're doing the same thing. And you're also remembering this and doing this, it says, until he comes. The second thing you have to realize is that when you take communion, you need to be in great anticipation of his coming again. Do it until I come. What's that mean? Until he comes. He could come at any time. And you know what I'm going to preach on tonight? I'll tell you right now because maybe I'll have 17 people tonight. I'm going to preach on the best day of your life. How about that? Now, you don't know what that is, but I'm going to tell you tonight the best day of your life. So basically, we need to anticipate his coming, look forward to it. And by taking communion, that's part of it. That's part of it. The last one I'm going to give you is found in Matthew. So if you don't mind turning over there, Matthew 26. Matthew 26. Matthew 26, 29. Matthew 26, 29. Look at this one. Matthew 26, 29. I got to go back a page. And one more. 26, 29. You ready? It says this. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine... Until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. We talked about this. We're going to have communion in heaven. Amen. I want to be there for that one. Because you know what? After the disciples left the upper room after the first or the last supper, if you want to say. What did they do? They sang. I want to hear heaven sing. I want to hear what the angels sang when they told the shepherds, don't you? I want to hear what it sounds like to have the entire heavenly host, millions and millions of people, sing. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. This is what we should be doing during communion. We should be remembering his death on the cross. Remember his communion with us, and he's worthy of our praise. Remember the communion that we have with each one of us when we take, take communion together. We need to remember to worship him singularly, nobody else. And take your thoughts off of everything else in just a couple minutes. We need to self-examine our hearts, make sure that there's nothing in us that would be displeasing to him. Some Sunday I'm going to preach on the sin unto death. Because there is one. You can be a believer today. And God can take you home. Like that. The sin unto death. We need to proclaim. That you're a Christian. By taking communion. You're doing that. And also we need to show our anticipation. And the 
hope that we have, not hope, hope, and hope, but the blessed hope that we have of heaven. All right? Now, that's our future, isn't it? I'm done. See, my goal every Sunday is to be out by 12 o'clock. It's not that I don't have anything else to say, but most people's attention span is 20 to 30 minutes. You don't need to preach an hour and a half. You can get just as much across in a short amount of time. And with communion this morning, we need to be out by 12. And I'm not going to rush it. And I'm not just sticking it at the end of a service because I think I did justice to remind you of what we should be doing. All right? Now, we're going to take communion. And... Uh,